Glad you're here today. Happy Father's Day to all of you dads. We are delighted that you have selected to be with us today and to celebrate Father's Day with us. Last Sunday morning, we concluded a series called What's in a Name on the Names of Jesus. And I promised you this week that we would have that series packaged and available all seven weeks. It has been done. It is on a table in the middle of the lobby. As you exit today, please stop by. You can grab one. If you'd like to leave a donation to help us with the cost, that's great. If you're incapable of doing that and you want one, please pick it up anyway, okay? If you want to pick up a week that you missed or if you want to share this information with somebody else, we'd like to get it into your hand. So these are available. Hey, we have some guests with us today. We have some special dads here today. Down on the end is Tom Clayton. This is Pastor Matt Clayton's father. All the way from the foreign land of Modesto. Modesto, yeah. (laughs) And in the middle is Greg Gottlieb. This is Pastor Paul's father, and he's down here from the Sacramento area. And then next to me is my father, Pastor Harley Allen from Roseville. Glad that you gentlemen agreed to be with us today, and uh, the sons have been very nervous this week for fear that dads are going to share some tales that we really don't want shared about our lives and our upbringings. You know, fatherhood is, uh, is an interesting thing. I love the fact that we get to stop once a year and we get to honor moms, and I love the fact that we get to stop once a year and honor dads. Today we're going to talk about principles that make us effective in life. Maybe that you're a dad, these will help. Maybe that you're a single mom, these will help. It may be that you're just a single person living in a house by yourself, these principles will help because these principles from God's Word today are designed to help you succeed in your life. I remember when I became a father, I I have two sons. And I remember the day very clearly that each one of those little boys were handed to me for the very first time by a nurse. The child was put into my hands and my world for the most part stopped around me and I was lost to my thoughts. I remember my first thought with my first son was, I don't think I can do this. It's a little late to be coming up with that analysis of the situation. I said to myself, I I don't know if I'm up to the challenge of shaping another life, teaching another young man how to be a man and how to have character and how to have integrity and how to do the things that a man of God is supposed to do. I was scared and I was overwhelmed. And I don't know if you've ever gotten there in life where you get scared and where you get overwhelmed with the circumstances and the situations that have been presented to you in life. Regardless of who you are or what you are doing in relation to parenting today, it's entirely possible that you've run into a set of circumstances and you've simply just said to yourself, I don't know if I'm up for this. We're going to talk today about Joseph. Joseph ran a carpenter shop. His wife's name was Mary, and Jesus was put in his home. Joseph was given the task of raising the Son of God in his home. If anybody ever had the right to stop and say, I don't know that I'm up for this, it would have been him. And from the life of Joseph today, we want to grab some lessons that are applicable to our lives to help us be successful. Because I believe that you can succeed in your life. I believe that God has uniquely gifted and equipped you to succeed in your life. That if God partners with you, there is no way you will fail in your life. I want to say that again. I know it's tough. I know it might not be what you ordered. But you can succeed because you have been uniquely qualified to succeed with God's help in your set of circumstances. We're going to look at Joseph today. 
And we're going to start this with the Claytons. And we're just going to share three different things that Joseph did really well in his life that equated ultimate success for him as a person and for him as a parent. Clayton's? The first thing that made Joseph uh, a great dad was that he loved God. Your best, with God's help, is enough to raise godly, world-changing sons or daughters in your home. Joseph loved God the best way he could. You could see Joseph's love for God and how he lived his life and made his decisions. Because how many know if you can't see love, it isn't love? Because love is seen in action. How do we know God loves us? Because he showed us by sending his son and dying on the cross for us. Joseph's love for God was identifiable. Jesus grew up in a home where he could see Joseph live out his love for God on a daily basis. You can see how Joseph loved God and how he obeyed God. Joseph loved God by obeying God quickly and co obeying God completely. Those are two very powerful words, quickly and completely. See, Joseph finds out that his fiancée is pregnant, Mary, and it isn't his child. How many know there's some drama happening in Bethlehem in, 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 where they're growing up, right? Some drama. Talk about drama. How would Joseph respond to this? What would he do? Well, in Matthew 1.20, it says, As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, and Joseph, son of David, the angel said, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, and he, for he will save his people from their sins. So God gives a command, and what does Joseph do? Does he take a few days to think about it? Does he lay a fleece out? Okay, God, if it's true what you're saying, then make this happen. Does he argue with God? I know no one in here ever does that, and I sure haven't in life. I mean, come on. Let's take a look at what Joseph did. Matthew 1, 24. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. But he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born, and Joseph named him Jesus. When he woke up, it's quick obedience, complete obedience. He did all that the angel had commanded. He loved God, so he obeyed God. See, even if it was inconvenient, even if he would face ridicule from his friends or neighbors in town, it didn't matter. He loved God, so he obeyed God. So after Jesus was born, in Matthew 2.13, an angel shows up again in Joseph's dream. And this time he says, get up and flee to Egypt. And what does Joseph do? In Matthew 2.14, it says, that very night, that night Joseph left for Egypt with the child and Mary, his mother, and they stayed there until Herod's death. Once again, in Matthew 2, after living in Egypt for some time, an angel appears telling Joseph to take his family back to Israel. And how does Joseph respond? Matthew 2.21, as soon as he gets up, he takes the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. And quick obedience, complete obedience. You could see his love for the Lord. You know, you can tell if someone loves God by the choices they make. In 1 John 2, 5, those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love him. That is how we know we are living in him. In 1 John 5, 3, loving God means keeping his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Love goes beyond a feeling and certainly a belief. Love is action. Now, obedience requires faith and submission. Faith to believe that what God has commanded is always the best way. And the submission that says that his will is more important than my will. He had huge faith and submission because he loves God. And this made him a great dad. I want to introduce you to my dad, Tom Clayton, a man of God that I look up to. A man that helped shape me into the man I am today. Thank you, my son, and whom I'm well pleased. <laughs> in listening to you talk about Joseph's obedience to God's commands, it reminds me of our family's commitment to also obey God's commands. We made a commitment early on in my wife and I's marriage to be faithful and obedient to God's word and his work. There were times when it seemed we couldn't go forward without his guidance. There were times when there was 
not enough money to make it to the next payday. But as God said in Malachi 3.10, bring in the tithes to the storehouse. And if you do, I will open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing. This reminds me of a story. During our time in Spokane, Washington, my family was very young. We only had about $20 per pay period to spend on groceries. So we would take a little calculator to the grocery store and we would add up to make sure that we didn't go over. And then we would look at what we got in the basket and sometimes we'd say, well, maybe we can do without the pudding because we need to get two more boxes of mac and cheese. As God said in Malachi 3.10 again, he said, test me. This is the only time that God ever said, test me. So we obeyed God and God was faithful to his word. Now the financial blessings are beyond anything that we could have ever hoped or even dreamed of. Obedience to God's word, obedience to God, was the key that opened the windows of heaven. I have found there is no better way to know God's voice than to spend time in prayer and to study his word. I remember when my children were young, I found the best time for me was to get up early in the morning and pray for them before their day began. In this quiet time with God, his answers were always right on and perfect. But don't get me wrong. There were many times when I thought I knew the way. I knew the right way. And I was disobedient. And guess what? Things didn't go right. They didn't go at all the way I thought they would go. But God was always faithful. He loved me. He restored me. And he continued to bless my family. It may not always be easy to obey God. Because our human nature wants to do our own thing. But obedience and faithfulness will always bring God's greatest blessings. I knew that if I loved God the best way I knew how, by obeying him, God's blessing would follow me, my wife, and my children. Dad, Dad, thank you uh, for loving God. For li you lived out your love for God right in front of me. Thank you for being an example to me. Your moms out there. Moms love God. College students love Jesus. Grandma, grandpa love God in front of others. Not just by a raised hand in a worship song or an occasional drop in the offering bag, but through quick and complete obedience on an everyday basis. Let us show our love for God by the choices that we make. Just like Joseph's love for God went beyond a feeling, it could be seen in how he lived. You too, when you love God by obeying him, it will speak volumes to your friends, to your co-workers, to your neighbors, to your family. Love God. It will make you the best version of yourself. This will make you a great dad, a great mom, a great person. And you will leave a legacy behind you of followers of Christ. You know, not only did Joseph love God, but we see that Joseph loved Mary. Now, my dad is not perfect, and, um, <laughs> but I, wa <laughs> I love him, I love, but I watched my dad every day fight to love God, fight to love his wife, fight to show love, and it's, it is so encouraging for me to watch my father as he's doing everything he knows to love, and Joseph not only loved God, but Joseph loved Mary. A wise man said once, the best thing a father can do for his children is to love their mother. You know, it's hard to be a great dad if you're a poor husband. Ephesians 5.25 says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. I mean, think about that scripture. It challenges us to love our wives like Jesus loved the church, to sacrifice, to serve, to walk in patience, to lay down our lives completely for her. What a challenge that we have as, as husbands and fathers. 
And we know, though, that loving people and walking in love is not just for husbands, but it's for all of us. We, we all have to learn how to walk in love. Jesus said in John 13, verse 34, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. We're, we're all called to walk in love. We're all called to love people. And we see that Joseph loved Mary, but this love did not come without its challenges. I mean, think about the story that we read in Matthew 1, verse 18 and 19, how Joseph finds out that his fiance is pregnant and he's not the father. That's, that becomes very difficult now. What do we do? What does Joseph do? How does he respond? You know, when, when Mary is promised to be his wife and a huge problem comes into the situation, what does Joseph do? Imagine the pain, imagine the anger, the embarrassment. Deuteronomy 22, 23, we see that, that in scripture, when a virgin was, uh, got pregnant before her wedding day, she could be taken out in stone. Legally, Joseph had the right. And, and we don't see that he does this. Joseph, what he does and how he responds is still an act of love. Joseph loved Mary by showing her grace. I wanna read Matthew 1, verse 19. It says, because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. I mean, think about that response. Joseph shows kindness, not judgment. Joseph tries to cover her, not embarrass her. Joseph acted like a righteous man, not a bitter man. He had every right to be mad, every right to be bitter, every right to be confused, and still he's acting like a righteous man. Only a righteous person can still show love in this type of situation. I believe that your love is always tested most when it's given to those who have hurt you. Because Joseph walked in grace towards Mary, God was still able to use Joseph to raise Jesus, the Son of God. And I believe that when we walk in grace and love towards others, it allows God to trust us with a great assignment in life with a powerful purpose, a dream, to do something great because we have learned how to walk in love, not just towards God, but to walk in love towards people. Amen. Um, okay, so I just found out I wasn't perfect, but that's okay. Um, <clears throat> the second way that, uh, that uh, Joseph loved Mary was to honor her. And, uh, and respect her. And it is interesting because Matt had brought up Matthew 120. It says that uh, that the angel visited Joseph in a dream, and as a result of that, he took Mary as his wife. That was the first step of honoring her, was to take her. And, and that didn't probably come without ridicule, because not the rest of the people weren't in his dream. So they probably didn't know the whole story. They're probably questioning. And sometimes when we make those decisions to honor and respect someone, um, sometimes even as employers and, and, and all those relationship situations, uh, sometimes that can be questioned. But, but, but that's how we show love, by honoring and respecting people. The second thing he did... Uh, in Matthew 125, it says that he didn't have union with her. And that's an interesting thing because when we were talking about this yesterday, when, when he got married and he was legal to do that, he chose not to. And that was a, a, a pretty awesome restraint, really. But he didn't want to disturb what God had going on. God was, had a process going on and he was working at work and, and Joseph wanted to honor and respect his wife in that way and let that uh, work that God was doing uh, take place. It's kind of interesting when I was talking to Paul earlier this week and he mentioned uh, our topic was was uh, Joseph, um, you know, loved Mary, loved his wife, and that's how you raise godly kids. Um, I'm not sure if Pastor Brett knew, but when uh, Paul was eight years old and his sister was six, uh, their mom and I got a divorce. And I thought, did he pick the right people? <laughs> but uh, but the thing about it to me, the divorce, you know, f for me, um, I didn't live out the Joseph expectation as a husband uh, the way I would have liked to. But the bottom line is divorce really meant in this situation um, things that happen to our, in our lives that are unexpected. They didn't happen the way it, we planned it. You know, anybody have that happen? You know, something didn't happen quite the way we had planned it. And, and that's what happened. But what we found out through that is that even Joseph, you know, the whole engagement and everything didn't work out the way he had planned it. Um, but what we found out through this whole situation and, and the end result of, of Paul's life and his, his sister's life is that... Um, when you're, when, you, when you're obedient, when you're faithful, when you honor and respect that person still, um, then good things happen. God becomes the redeemer and the restorer and the healer of relationships and, and allows the, and the, the end result, the fruit, is godly kids. And one of the things that, uh, 
when I remarried, one of the things that, that Patty and I uh, made sure of was anytime Paul and Amy were in our house is that we reinforced um, the rules and the, the laws and the, the, the situations that their mom had put in place. So that was the way, even though wasn't married to her still, the way to honor her and the way to respect her was to enforce that obedience um, all the time and, and, and support her in raising those two kids. And, um, and, I, if, and just for a minute, for, for those that are in that situation where you have uh, kids and, and, and dual families and situation like that, um, keep the kids out of the arena. You know, now Paul's 31, Amy's 28, we don't have to worry about that too much. Uh, but when they're little, you know, they want to come and they pitch you against each other. I don't know if anybody's ever been there. Uh, but they pitch you against each other, and you can't, you can't go there. You know, you have to love and respect and honor that spouse, that, 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 that partner, even in the midst of that. So uh, you love and, and, and raise your kids in a godly way by respecting and, and loving their mother. It goes beyond that, too, though. Um, uh, it goes to, in Romans 12.10, it says, Love each other uh, with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. So it goes really... Uh, to relationships beyond just the husband and wife and the spouse. We were talking about this yesterday, just in an re employer relationship. Um, you know, I work for a VP and they have some different opinions and we have to honor and respect their position and their title and, and do the things that are right. Uh, it doesn't really matter if you're a husband, a father, a wife, or a child. We need to walk in love towards everybody. And that's how, how uh, healing and, and, and redemption takes place. It says that uh, what Joseph did with Mary uh, that's what we need to do. Joseph loved Mary by walking in grace and by giving her honor. And when we do that, it allows God to do his work. And the end result is, is godly kids that, that serve the Lord or are redeemed and, and, and healed situations. I would like to look at the life of uh, Joseph and Jesus from a viewpoint of direction. He loved his family, he loved his son, in that he gave his son direction. Let me read to you from Luke number 2, verse 22. When the day of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. We had a couple do that this morning with two little boys. They presented their children to the, to the Lord. In the Bible, children, babies are not baptized. Adults are baptized when you're old enough to understand what baptism is about. So Jesus was presented at the temple to God as this couple did this. Then it says also in chapter 2, The child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. They were learning early to give direction, godly direction, to their child. And then it says in verse 52, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature, and in favor with God and men. The early years of uh, Christ are interesting, and we don't know as much as we'd like to about them. We know that his dad was a carpenter, owned a carpenter shop in the noisy little dirty town of Nazareth. I like to go to Nazareth because I always like to wander the streets and, and wonder where Jesus grew up, where he played soccer, and where the shop was. In that shop, he learned a lot of lessons. He learned to work. Now, I'd like to say that again because of the culture in which I live. He learned to work. Work is a godly thing. He learned to build tables. He learned to build chairs. And praise God, he built yokes, too. He had a boss. There was submission. He learned that, too, at an early age. He learned to deal with customers, grouchy customers and mean customers and lazy customers who don't pay their bills. He looked out the window and said, there come the Goldbergs. They never do like my work, and they never pay their bills. He learned about money in that, little customer, in that little shop. And then I like one other thought very much of him growing up as a child, working with his father. That is, they had time to talk to each other. One of the comments about present-day fatherhood is we have so little time to talk to our children. So day by day by day by day, Joseph had every little uh, opportunity and every large opportunity to, to talk to his son. I can just hear Joseph saying to Mary, would you take him to soccer practice today? And her saying, Joseph, I have taken him for the last three days. Could you please take him to soccer practice today? Unfortunately, Jesus didn't get to play football. He had to settle for soccer. I'm sure that's one of the great regrets in his life. So he had time to talk. 
Brett was a soccer player. That's why he's holding his head. Uh, he, had, they had time to visit. They had time to talk. Uh, one of the great privileges in my life was as the senior pastor for seven years, Pastor Brett was my youth pastor. His office was right next door to mine, so I could keep an eye on him and listen to his music. He called it music. But we had tremendous interaction. We could talk and talk and talk and visit and talk back and forth. What a wonderful thing, dads, huh? That Jesus had from Joseph the ability simply to talk and work together. In his adulthood, Joseph shared some things that were hurtful to him. They've been mentioned already. God said to him, here's a young woman I want you to marry, but she's pregnant. And she thinks that the father of this child is God. Now that'll get you on the Oprah show every day of the week. <laughs> the neighbor's saying, poor guy. He knows it's not his. He has no idea whose it is. And he's supposed to marry her and believe that God is the father. So I'm sure he shared these thoughts with, uh, with uh, Jesus on a very uh, intimate basis. Jesus, there are going to be some difficult days ahead of you. You're going to be misunderstood. You're going to be ridiculed. And I just want you to know, Jesus, be faithful to what God has called you to do. Because even when the hard times come, he learned values. He learned priorities. I don't know how much Joseph knew about the future of Jesus when he would see all those thousands of people thronging around him when he would see the Pharisees waiting for him to make a mistake, when he would appear here and there and the people would crush him. But he taught him priorities. The reason I know that is because everywhere in the Bible, though he's thronged with people, you never, ever, ever see Jesus in a hurry. How about this one, judgment? Boy, when you pick those disciples in, Joseph didn't know that, but he was training him for the days ahead when those things would happen. Do that right. And then lastly, I like the idea of just good old-fashioned stick to itiveness. Work in the shop. Go to work every day. Mary's saying to Jesus, I don't care if you don't feel good today. Get up and go to work, as she packed two lunches for him and Joseph. You know, it's an astounding thought to me, in terms of perseverance, that God sent his son to work in a carpenter shop for almost 30 years. The world's going to hell. People need a Messiah. They're begging for a Messiah. They're praying for a Messiah. And Jesus is over there every day working in a carpenter shop. You ever had some timing issues with God? Streets of gold, pearly gates. What God needs is a good $5 watch, in my opinion. Because God's timing is so off, isn't it? Well, you guys have it all worked out. I don't have it all worked out with God. So perseverance, perseverance, get up and go to work. Do this year after year after year after year. Because one of these days, that perseverance is going to lead you to a cross. You're going to be misunderstood. You're going to be hated. You're going to be ridiculed. You're going to be spit upon. And then some Romans are going to put some nails in your hands. You're going to need the perseverance because, after all, you are, after all, you are the Lamb of God who's come to take away our sins. Dads, we don't just buy food and protection for our kids. We buy wisdom, we provide wisdom, we provide stature, and we provide favor with God and men. Huh? What a great job. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Listen, you preach a lot of years. Boy, you just don't miss. You know, you're just on. You are always ready. Wish we'd given you more than four minutes today. We'll have to have, to have you back another time. For and the eight, reason eight minutes, I your mic's off right now. <laughs> and the reason my office was next to his had nothing to do with my music. It had to do with the fact that when he needed me, he would hit the wall. And I would come running. And he needed me close enough that he could bang on the wall and not have to use the phone. That's, that's the truth, and the Lord knows it. <laughs> you get to heaven, you can double check it with him, because I'm sure the story would be different yeah. if this mic worked, which, Don't. praise the Lord, it's not. <laughs> and Rand, it better not. Don't strike him dead. <laughs> so, Joseph loved God, and Joseph loved Mary, and Joseph loved his family. And one of the things that Joseph did to demonstrate his love for his family is he protected his family. 
And the way he protected his family was through a close relationship with God. As you read Matthew 2, as you read the story of the birth of Christ, there is a list of things that Joseph doesn't know anything about. And he's in the middle of this story, and he's a key player. And somehow in modern day, he's been pushed a little bit to the side because we focus on the wise men and the shepherds with angels visiting, and Mary was incredible, and we have all of this story about Jesus. And in this story is a carpenter who has a close relationship with God, and there's all kinds of stuff he doesn't know. He doesn't know about the conversation that will take place between the wise men and King Herod. He doesn't know that Herod says, when you find that Christ child, would you let me know that I can worship him too? And they don't know, he doesn't know that they fool Herod and they head off another direction. He doesn't know that Herod is going to retaliate by killing every child two years, every male child two years and younger in that region. He doesn't know these things. But God did. God knew every one of them. And because of the fact that Joseph had this intimacy with God, because he had this closeness with God, God was able to give him insight and direction so that his family could be protected. I need you to pick up Joseph, your family, and I need you to go to Egypt. And I need you to stay there because it's going to keep you and your family alive. All right, now I need you to get up and move again. Unbelievable. It's difficult to protect our families. There are things that happen on a daily basis in the lives of our families, in our personal lives, that we have no idea that's coming toward us. But God knows. And the way to protect, the way to stand strong, the way to defend is always best to check in with God and get God's wisdom and God's perspective because nothing's coming your way that God doesn't already know about. I think the role of protection goes from difficult to impossible when I remove God from the sequence and when I remove God from the equation. The second thing, this story about Joseph, Mary, and Jesus, the wise men, and Herod, teaches us is there are people who desire to hurt your family. It's something we don't like to think about, something we sure don't like to talk about, but the simple fact is that there are people who hurt people. There is an enemy out there who is bent on your destruction. He hates you. He hates your marriage and he hates your home and will do what he can do to bring destruction. This statement that I just made would seem like paranoia if it weren't for the fact that Matthew 2 was written moving it into the realm of reality. There are forces at work in our world that threaten your marriage, your child's safety, and your personal well-being. Hey, Dad, if you won't stand up and defend, if you won't stand up and fight, if you won't stand up and protect, then who's going to do it? If you're a single person today, stand up and fight for what's right and fight for the home that you have to be defended against what's evil. If you're a married couple... Stand up and fight for what's right. Don't allow it to just go. Stand up and defend and to fight. You know, Mark's over here. He just dedicated his boys today, and he's wearing red flowers on his shoulder because of the fact that it takes courage, and it takes strength, and it takes commitment. And Mark, we salute you today for standing up here today with your boys and with your wife and giving your babies back to God and saying, I'm going to be a courageous, strong dad, but God, I need your help to do this. That's what Joseph was, and we salute you today for that, my friend. (laughs) 
The last thing about protection with Joseph and his family is that God's direction resulted in safety. In chapter 2 of Matthew, there are three times that God gave Joseph direction, told him to move. Once in verse 13, once in verse 20, and once in verse 22. God provided direction each one of these times. God's direction is pretty simple as it relates to our family. It's two prongs. Number one is to keep you safe. And number two is to keep you in the center of his will. And with God's direction in Joseph's life and for Joseph's family, both of those things were accomplished. There was safety for the family, and the family stayed in the center of God's will. Dad, you're the leader of your family. Dad, you're the priest of that home. Single mom, you're the leader of that family. You're the priest of that home. Single person who lives by yourself, you're the priest of your family and the leader of your home. And you can do this thing successfully if you'll include God on a regular basis, if you will love him. He will provide the protection that is necessary to be a godly family in a godless age in which we live. You're going to need the protection that God provides. You're also going to need his wisdom, his direction, and his insight. Maybe there's a whole list of things about your life you just don't know the answers to. Sure true with Joseph. You know what? He succeeded. What he did was enough because he partnered with God. And all you have to do to succeed in this life is your very best and partner with God. And it's going to be enough for you to succeed. Situation's tough. Situation isn't what you asked for. Situation isn't the ideal. It's okay. You are uniquely qualified and gifted for what God has allowed into your life. And you will succeed if you'll partner with God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. I'm going to ask you to give me just a couple of minutes before anybody starts moving around. We've been talking about loving God and hearing from God, speaking to God, being directed by God. We've been talking about God's will and God's direction. It's possible that you're here today and in your life, you could feel overwhelmed and a little bit misunderstood. Maybe you don't have a relationship with God. The reason that God sent his son to live in a carpenter shop to begin with was so that he could grow to maturity and die on a cross so that your sins could be forgiven and you could have a relationship with God. And as we sit here today on Father's Day and as we talk about partnering with God for success in our lives, I'd like to extend an opportunity for you to ask Jesus into your life. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And in this prayer, we're going to tell God that we're aware that we've sinned and that we're sorry. And we're going to ask him to come in and to help us. And right where you sit, in the quiet of a moment, I would invite you to say this prayer. Repeat this prayer right after me. God will hear every single word. Let's pray. Dear Jesus. I know I've sinned. I'm sorry. I don't want it to be like that anymore. I want my life to be different. I give you my past and I ask you to forgive it. And I give you today and my future and I ask you to help me. To guide me and to direct me and to protect me. I need you in my life. What a great day to say that prayer. On Father's Day, to say, Father God, I need you in my life.